You are listening to Light Hearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. We have just one guest in today's episode, my good friend Bob Trapani Jr., the executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation. Regular listeners to the podcast will be very familiar with Bob. He's been on the podcast a number of times. In today's interview, we mostly talk about Maine Open Lighthouse Day, uh, which is a very special day that takes place on the second Saturday of September each year. This year it's on September 9th. It's really a, a day that celebrates Maine lighthouses. A number of them are open on that day. Some of them are uh, ones that are not normally open to the public, so it's a real treat for people to uh, see them inside and out. Also in this conversation, we talk about a recent lightning strike at a lighthouse in Maine. Very interesting topic. So let's get right into it. Let's listen to my conversation with Bob Trapani now. I'm talking with my good friend Bob Trapani Jr. this morning. Uh, And of course, Bob, uh, as regular listeners know, because he's been on this podcast quite a few times, Bob is the executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation. And he's, uh, he's many things in addition to that. He's an author and photographer and uh, also a lighthouse technician uh, or an ace navigation technician for the Coast Guard Auxiliary. What is the correct terminology for that, Bob? I'm an auxiliarist that serves as a lighthouse technician, and I work with uh, Coast Guard Aids Navigation Team Southwest Harbor and mm-hmm. uh, occasionally in South Portland as well. Uh, I always say you're one of the people who sees lighthouses from multiple angles literally, uh, lighthouses and lenses and optics and everything else. It's, it's a blessing. Yeah. You know, you, you, t- you don't try to take it for granted because it, it is truly something that's uh, special. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the photography. And before we get into Maine Open Lighthouse, though, let me just, uh, while we're on that topic, you put out a, a, another book recently, right? I did earlier in the year, Gleams and Whispers, uh, Maine Lighthouses and their Allure which mm-hmm. is a, uh, you know, a prose book. I like to look at lighthouses. We, we talk about how um, symbolic they are and what they mean to people, you know, romance, mystery. And in this book, I just try to explore, you know, those aspects um, that we often feel in our heart and maybe don't always articulate as well as we'd like to. Mm-hmm. So I explore that using metaphors and just mixing in uh, history that's subtle to, to some of this. And uh, yeah. And then actually, uh, there's a, I have yet another one coming out. So it's kind of a, a sister book to that. It's uh, Beacons of Wonderment that's going to be coming out by the uh, late latter part of September. Oh, so, cool. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Fantastic. So and, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot of fun to look at lighthouses in that way. I mean, you know, it was something different to be able to say, I, I love the history. I love visiting and taking photos. Um, but what they, they mean so much to us. And I wanted to see, can I express anything from the heart? And so that was part of this, this effort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you do a great job of it. And as I said, uh, you know, it's hard to think of anybody else uh, that kind of sees lighthouses from such uh, diverse angles uh, as you do. So the main topic we want to address today uh, is Maine Open Lighthouse Day, which this year is coming up on September 9th, right? That is correct. Uh, And remind me, is it the second Saturday in, in September every year? You got it. It's always the second Saturday in September. And uh, let's start by talking about how did Maine Open Lighthouse Day start? Uh, who Whose idea was it and how did it get going in the first place? And when did it get going in the first place? The idea for Maine Open Lighthouse Day was uh, actually the idea of Captain James McPherson, who at the time was uh, uh, in charge of sector northern New England. And uh, I, I think today Mr. McPherson is actually involved in the Wood Island Life Saving Station. I think he's on the board for that today. So Captain McPherson, he was awesome. He had so much energy, he wanted to be able to uh, showcase Maine's lights in a different way, and then also uh, tie in different aspects. Of course, the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard's role in it. Uh, because as as you know, Jeremy, we, we talk about this from time to time. The lighthouses, they're making different kind of history today, but they're still making history. And Captain McPherson realized that, and he wanted to bring a little bit of a, a light to that as well. And so the event is sponsored by uh, the American Lighthouse Foundation, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the main office of tourism. And the idea was, his idea was to blend preservation, the Coast Guard's role, and the charm of the main coast and all that people can see while they're visiting a lighthouse, because there's so much more to see in the communities that these lighthouses reside in. So 
the idea was really not only a good one, but geez, the lighthouse groups ever since have just, this is like the, the event for a number of main lighthouses uh, each year. And so it's a tribute to Captain McPherson that this will be our 14th one, uh, would have been 15 if 2020 with COVID didn't take that one out, but the uh, 14th year for it. And the fact that it's not only sustained, but uh, the interest is still there. And, uh, you know, you might say that almost all time high. I think it's great. So mm -hmm. that is great. And uh, I was remembering that you and I were involved in a kind of a program at Portland Headlight. Was that was that the first main open lighthouse day or what was, was it was early the, on? It was the second, second one. Yeah, okay. it was 2010. That was a that was mm -hmm. a great event. We had a nice day. Uh, it was you and Bill Thompson was a speaker yep. and myself and there was uh, other dignitaries and the admiral was there. Yeah, it was really a good event. Uh, again, to, nice to be able to get the uh, uh, idea of main open lighthouse day out in front of the media mm -hmm. and to be able to share that far and wide. So yeah. and uh, you had a you had a really nice speech that day. That was that was a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I posted that online. It is uh, online somewhere, but uh, I can't remember off the top of my head <laughs> how to find it, but I know it is is posted there. But that that was a, a beautiful day. It's great to be part of that. And um, you can't beat the backdrop of Portland Head, right? I mean, that's just uh, Maine's oldest lighthouse. Absolutely. How many lighthouses are taking part this year? We have 19 lighthouses that are going to be open and 21 total with a couple lighthouses just having their keepers houses open. But yeah, 19 lighthouses for people to choose which ones they want to climb this year. That's pretty impressive. And most of those are ones that are not normally open. Is that, would that be correct? Yeah, that is true. It's uh, that's what makes this event so exciting is that a lot of these lighthouse sites, it, it may be the only time they open or they only open a couple times per year. Uh, but for some of them, it's the only time of the year they're open. And that's what helps generate a lot of excitement for people. How about we go through the list and maybe at least touch on, on each one and tell people what's going on at these places in case, sure, they're, let's do in case, they're, in case they live in Maine or will be coming to Maine at that time. Uh, and I think, it, well, let me, uh, before we do that, let me ask you, do you have any sense of numbers? I mean, it's pretty hard with all these different sites, but is there some estimate of like how many people take part at these lighthouses on, on Maine Open Lighthouse Day? In recent years, in the last couple of years, we haven't actually got numbers back. We used to get numbers for a longest point of time. Um, mm -hmm. And there was an average of about 15 to 18,000 people. Uh, they don't all climb the tower, of course. Uh, a lot of those numbers were also how many people on site or an estimated a number of people on site. Uh, because as you know, I mean, depending on the tower, you're only going to get so many people up and down in a six hour period because the event runs from nine to three. Mm -hmm. uh, unless the lighthouses have a special time, which a few of those do this year. Um, but uh, not only that, some people don't want to climb. They just like, they love being sure. on site that day and the excitement and energy around the lighthouses. And so we used to see about 15, 18,000. I don't know what recently uh, we've see, been seeing, but it's a lot. So let's go through the list. Uh, you have them, uh, I believe, in alphabetical order. And let me just say that if people want to uh, look at the list themselves, they should go to uh, the American Lighthouse Foundation website, which is lighthousefoundation.org. And there's a link on the front page, right? So that's really easy to find, lighthousefoundation.org. So the first lighthouse on the list is Burnt Coat Harbor Lighthouse on Swans Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what's really neat about this one? This is... Uh... You, you know, this is one of those island ones, but you can take a ferry out to it. And the Friends of Swans Island Lighthouse have just done an amazing job over the years, as you know, Jeremy. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Restoring both the Keeper's House and the Tower. And that's just a, that's one of those picture-perfect places nestled there on the head, Hockamock Head. And it's just, uh, wow, just a great place to explore, so... Yeah, you, you've been there, you know. I've been there before and after restoration, and what a difference. Uh, it's a beautiful place, and uh, I've only been on the island, I think, three times over the years, but the last time was to uh, interview the Chetwins for uh, was it Eric Eric and Fran Chetwin. Eric and Fran. Yeah. That group's energy is so impressive. So, yeah, if you if you choose to visit Burnt Coat Harbor Light on Swans Island and Maine Open Light, that you will not be disappointed. Yeah. So the next lighthouse on the list is Burnt Island in uh, Booth Bay Harbor. Yes. And this one has a special time of 9 to 12 uh, being open. It is one that requires you to have your own transportation. So for those who like to kayak or, or uh, you know, have their own boat to be able to go out to uh, Burnt Island. Uh, another one that 
fully restored and not just fully restored, but the, uh, in the past, their living history program was just, just dynamite. It was amazing. And mm -hmm. Elaine Jones, uh, who had, he was in charge of that project for so many years, she's now since retired. She was, she was really the spearhead behind all of that. And, uh, yeah. Boy, is that gleaming. I mean, what a legacy that Elaine has left there yeah. for an island. That's another one I've known since before uh, they restored it. And uh, it is an incredible operation there. Elaine, uh, I've known Elaine a very long time and she's been on this podcast and that's a great place to visit. Curtis Island in Camden is next. Yes. Curtis Island at the uh, entrance to Camden Harbor, another one that requires uh, people to have their own transportation to get out. Uh, this is a very popular one. I know a lot of people like to either either have their own kayak or rent kayaks right in Camden Harbor, uh, which you can easily do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a short trek out to Curtis Island. And that is such a cool experience. You land on the backside of the island, you get to walk across and and as you come through the clearing of the trees, there's this lighthouse and it just looks amazing. This little lighthouse at the end of the harbor and I mean, at the end of the island there. And yeah, it's uh, it's worth a visit if you're one of those who like to uh, get out on the water and adventure in a kayak, be well worth it. Yeah, I love I love Curtis Island. To me, it's, uh, it's hard to beat as far as just uh, scenic uh, beauty, prettiness, you know, I think of it uh, right up there with the Nubble and uh, a few others is uh, one of the prettiest lights in Maine. So the next on the list is Doubling Point. Yes, Doubling Point near Bath on the Kennebec River. And this mm -hmm. one will be open all day, nine to three. Uh, really neat that, um, and, and, and you know these folks, Jeremy, Karen, and Dan McLean, they will yep. be volunteering that day, former lighthouse keepers themselves. And uh, I think you could probably speak to something about that with them, because I know you've talked to them on a podcast. In the yeah, I had... Uh... Uh, Karen and Dan McLean, and also Jim and Joyce Spencer, who've uh, been with that organization a long time uh, on the podcast. We sat in the Keeper's House and did that uh, not that long ago. All really nice people. And that's another one that's just so pretty. It's, you know, some people think of lighthouses, they think of what you might call majestic lighthouses, like Portland Head would be one of those. Uh, these last couple we've talked about, uh, Curtis Island, Doubling Point, they're, they're not majestic. You wouldn't use that word. But they're just uh, they're charming. Just they're charming. charming. Charming is yes. a perfect yes. word. Yeah. Charming is an absolutely perfect word for them. Yeah, and I you remember. did mention the Spencers, Jim and Joyce. They uh, for many many years, as you know, they they did some great work repairing the pier, keeping that structure going. Um, it was a big project when they removed that lighthouse from the pier to re to replace that. Yeah, it's a, each one of these places. That's what's cool when you go to Maine Open Lighthouse. That you're going to get all these beautiful sites, but you learn a little bit too about you know not only. Mm -hmm. The preservation elements but all that goes into it you know it's a lot of work and it happens over time and people don't realize that so when you look at a lighthouse and it looks great you can know that somebody's done a lot of work over a lot of years for sure <laughs> you and i know that is yes uh, certainly very much uh so the next one is dice head and castine is another one i'm very familiar with i've been there a number of times over the years and i know it's very rarely open to the public it is the venerable Dice Head Lighthouse. You know, it's one of those ones when I look back in history, I see it as a quiet station. You know, not a lot of dramatic moments, but very old lighthouse in a very historic maritime town, which has a lot to uh, share with people. And really what's cool lately is they've, um, the interior of the lighthouse has been repainted. Uh, so the staircase and all, uh, mm -hmm. it looks great. So it's, uh, it's neat to see something, a tower so old looking so nice. And if you choose to go to Dice Head during Main Open Lighthouse, you'll get to experience that firsthand. Yeah. Well, Castine's a great, it's a small town, but it's a great town to visit. Very picturesque. The harbors is beautiful. So, as and you that's said, the, mm -hmm. you know, this, Jeremy, that Dice Head was one that in the, it was, I guess, it was the mid 1930s when it got decommissioned and he put the, the light closer to the water. And then a microburst in 2007 or eight took took down that skeleton tower and the town asked the Coast Guard to put the light back in the tower and the Coast Guard said yes. So yep. that's a you know that's another story that's added to the history of Dice Head Lighthouse. Definitely. And the house burned, almost burned down uh 20 or so years ago as well. It was a bad fire. The roof was mostly yeah. gone. They considered tearing it down, but they restored it instead. And it's a beautiful house. And that's important too because that the, the keeper's house or the former keeper's house is actually private residence. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that we, you know, visitors always encourage to respect the uh, the privacy of, of places like that. So though the tower is open, you know, the house is a private residence. Definitely. 
the next lighthouse on the list is Fort Point in Stockton Springs. That's one you and I are quite familiar with over the years. Yeah, right. It's uh, it's situated right as the Penobscot Bay ends and the Penobscot River begins. Really, it's it's uh, it's it's at an interesting spot. It's uh, one of the little cool things for people who visit this. It's a square tower with a spiral staircase inside. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a little bit unique to see that, and it still has its fourth order Fresnel lens, which yep. is there's only eight of them left in main lighthouses today. So that is one where people will get a close up view of a Fresnel lens. Yeah, that's one of those places where the grounds are open every day, but the but the tower is not open for climbing ordinarily. So. Right, and uh, another one to uh, respect the privacy there because the uh, park ranger does reside in the keeper's house. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the longtime residents there were Terry and Jerry Cole, who you and I know uh, quite well, and they've been on the podcast as well. Uh, oh my they're, goodness. They're, how many years were they there? It was uh, 30. I think it was at least yeah. 30. Yeah. Yeah. As a Coast Guard keeper, then later as a ranger. Right. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in an earlier life, as a, Terry was a Coast Guard keeper there. So uh, very much part of the history of that place. Uh, next is Goat Island Lighthouse in Kenny Bunkport. Oh, this is a cool spot. This is one of those ones, though, that's uh, tide dependent. Another one that you have to get yourself out to. And a lot of people do actually kayak to Goat Island. But at low tide, the, uh, the docks are pretty much inaccessible. So, which is why we have a special time on this one. This very early, 6 a.m. to 11 a.m., or very later in the day when the tide comes back. You could also go back if you wanted, but uh, they will have the tower open for anybody who can get themselves out there. Um, mm -hmm. But again, that's just one to remember that if you do like the kayak, it is tide dependent. Yeah. And yeah. there's another one where uh, the Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust has just done some amazing things over the years, rebuilt that covered walkway that connects the house to the tower uh, and the bell tower. The bell tower we rebuilt. I mean, they just, uh, they've tried to stay as historically accurate as all our groups do, mm -hmm. um, but they've done some, you know, tremendous work over the years to uh, restore some of the visual glory of, uh, of a place like Goat Island. They definitely have. And uh, you took part in the podcast interview, right? With Karen and uh, Scott Dombrowski and uh, Tom Bradbury. Yeah. Uh, well, that was a lot of fun, you know, yeah. and, and learn something, you know, it's, it's something on, on, on your podcast like this it's like we always learn something and even when you're interviewing even there in person i mean you're hearing things a lot of the questions precipitate comments and it's like wow and it's mm -hmm. like you think you know things and then you realize man there's a lot to learn yet so yeah well that's the fun thing that's one of the fun things about this podcast i certainly learned uh, learn a lot every week next is grindle point lighthouse in islesboro the island of islesboro the island town yeah, this is uh, this is one of the sites, one of the two sites where the lighthouse is not open, but the keeper's house, which houses a museum, sailors museum. Yes, uh, really neat. It's got a lot of uh, cool exhibits, a lot of uh, very old antiquity type of items in there. Uh, if you do find yourself to, if you have time to shoot over on the ferry, that would be well worth it. The tower's closed right now. They're doing some, um, they're just doing some interior projects, or will be doing some interior projects there, uh, which. They don't, they don't feel that they can have the tower open for right now, but mm -hmm. they have been a long time participant and the, you know, the tower had been open for years there. So. Yeah. Uh, real easy to go to, you get the ferry from Lincolnville beach and it, the lighthouse is right next to the ferry terminal when you get off at Islesboro. And actually some of the best photographic views are from the ferry as you come in, I think the views of the lighthouse. Oh, you, you got that right. That's, that is, I think that would be, especially if you're elevated on the ferry, it's a really neat view. And theirs is 8.30 to 4.30, and that's really following the ferry schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so people should know if they do that, they if they just want to go to the lighthouse there, they don't have to bring their car over on the ferry. It's again, the uh, lighthouse is right next to the ferry terminal. So you can just walk on and walk off. That's a great point. So next is the Kennebec River Range Lights. Uh, also known as the Dublin Point Range Lights uh, in uh, Arousic. Aren't these, uh, these are <laughs> these are like really cute structures. You know, people don't look at them necessarily and see, oh, is that a lighthouse? And yeah, that is a lighthouse, uh, range lights. And uh, for those who don't understand what a range light is, it's, you know, the rear light sits back from the front light. And when a mariner's coming up, in this case, the Kennebec River, they just want to be able to sight the rear light directly over top of the front light shining. Mm -hmm. And that tells them that they're in center channel. The range light keepers are the nonprofit group that take care of this and uh, these two sites. And they've 
undergone some recent restoration here. Uh, and over the years, uh, the Range Light Keepers have done a number of projects, including the Fiddler's Reach Fog Bell Tower, which they restored so amazingly. But uh, yeah, and the interior of these places, it's like you're going back in time. It's, it's just amazing. They're, it's pretty much undisturbed from, from what it was when, you know, in, in their glory years. And again, that's a tribute to uh, Range Lake Keepers keeping these structures watertight so that the interiors of these places uh, look amazing. Mm -hmm. These are well worth visiting. It's, they really are. Yeah. Well, it's such a beautiful spot. Uh, I've uh, vi visited there many times. I've taken tours there. It's uh, off the beaten track. It's just down the dirt road from Dublin Point Light that we talked about a few minutes ago. I've never been in those towers. As you were talking, I realized I've never been inside them. Uh, oh, we'll have to fix that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and they have a special time of 10 to 2. So that is something to consider. I know some folks like to do the, the Kennebec River lights. And if you do, just make sure you this, this one's going to be closing an hour before the others. So, yeah. Yeah. One of the things I always remember about that place is that, uh, you know, who the uh, famous French photographer Jean Guichard is, who took the, I'm sure a lot of listeners know, he took the, maybe the most famous lighthouse photo of all time of a La Jamont lighthouse off the Brittany coast of France with a giant wave coming around with a keeper standing in the doorway. I'm sure people, most people I think know what I'm talking about. So I got to show him around to some of the main lighthouses back in 2001. And we went to Dublin Point and the, the range lights on the river. And while we were at the range lights, uh, we, I'm pretty sure it was an otter we saw swimming in the river. But then at Dublin Point, there was a deer walking around right near us. And I remember Jean Guichard, you know, seeing all this nature. He said, it is like a Disney film here. <laughs> As you know, the Kennebec River's got a lot of seals, but the otters, yeah. Well, I, you very well may have seen an otter there. So next is Marshall Point Lighthouse in Port Clyde, which is uh, part of the town of St. George. And uh, we want to talk about it in this context, but maybe we'll save it for, for after we talk, finish talking about Maine Open Lighthouse Day. There's something else that's happened with Marshall Point recently. But uh, that's another one I visited a zillion times over the years, but never actually been inside the tower. Yeah, this is uh, another example of uh, one of those lights that's not always open. I think this year, though, they've had the lighthouse open more. I think they've, they, they have. But in years past, it was only open for special tours and things of that nature. So this is on the bucket list for a lot of people. Uh, of course, the, the Forrest Gump connection to Marshall yep. Point is a big draw. Um, but this is uh, one of those sites where the the museum inside the Keeper's House is part of the experience, that you not only get to climb a lighthouse, but you get to go inside and see a museum that has um, the former drum Fresnel lens inside mm -hmm. that was in Marshall Point on exhibit with a lot of other uh, lighthouse or maritime related uh, exhibits, and even uh, some of the local lobstering um, exhibits that they have, which I think is really cool because it puts context of why these lighthouses, they were, they were part of a community and each community, although they would have had some similar aspects, they each have their own uniqueness too. So you get to feel that a little bit when you're at Marshall Point and go inside the museum. Mm -hmm. Beautiful keeper's house there that the museum is inside. And uh, there's a nice gift shop in there too. Nice little oh, shop. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? That's neat too, because you not only get to come away with an, a couple items that you, you know, to remind yourself of that experience, but for all these groups, anything that they are offering for sale is helping their project, which I think is really important for people to understand that, you know, when you buy something from one of these lighthouse groups, it's going back into the project. So that's so mm -hmm. cool. So next on the list is Monhegan, Monhegan Island Lighthouse, which uh, you can get to from a couple of different places, right? Yes, out of Port Clyde and... Um, Actually, three places, I think. Uh, got, New Harbor. Right. Uh, by the, uh, what's it called? Shaw's Lobster Wharf there. You get a boat from there. And Booth Bay Harbor. And uh, Monhegan is, is famous uh, partly for its artist colony for many years. A lot of artists have spent a lot of time there. Uh, Jamie Wyeth, for one, has done done some paintings there and uh, at Manana Island uh, right near there as well, uh, which has a fog signal station on it. So it's a, Monhegan's a fascinating place. Lighthouse uh, is situated in it kind of unusually up on a, up on a hill, and uh, that also has a museum. But again, that tower is not normally open, right? Right. That tower is not normally open. You mentioned the lighthouse up on the hill. You know this, Jeremy, from, from all the stuff you've written about history. The, uh, because of its location, it wasn't a very effective spot to put a, a fog bell back in the day. 
And eventually that's where the station then got moved to the Fog Bell and then Foghorn Station got moved over to Banana Island. And was that was an active station up until about 2013, 14, as far as um, a foghorn being there. And then they decided they didn't, they just did away with it. But yeah, that lighthouse is, it's right in the center of the island, like a, like a crown there on the top of the hill. And it's mm -hmm. always something really cool to be able to walk up the uh, trails to get to Monhegan Light. And this one's going to have, um, Monhegan has uh, been participating in Maine Open Lighthouse Day from the beginning. This has a special time of 1130 to 330. And it is, again, another one where you're going to see a lighthouse, but the community, um, both the seasonal and the small year-round community that is on Monhegan Island, you get the sense of, uh, of island life, uh, real island life, and uh, just how far out to sea, you know, about 10 miles out, but mm -hmm. it, isolation, and you think about the lighthouse keepers, and I know, Jeremy, you've... Uh, we, we just lost recently a dear friend, uh, Ernie DeRaps, but you've interviewed, we interviewed Ernie together, actually. At his home, yeah. Podcast. He was stationed here, and he had a lot of stories to talk about Monhegan Light. He sure did. Yeah, Ernie was a, a fantastic guy, uh, and uh, people might want to check out the uh, the podcast uh, episode that featured him a while back. Uh, sorry that he uh, recently passed away. But in addition to the museum in Monhegan, at Monhegan, the museum in the Keeper's House, there's also an art gallery, right, on the uh, light station grounds? Yes, in the uh, in the rebuilt uh, Assistant Keeper's House, uh, mm -hmm. which another uh, another great story about bringing something back that was lost, doing it historically accurate, and have this wonderful adaptive reuse for the property. Uh, the folks at the uh, Monhegan Museum of Art and History uh, should be commended for all the work they've done there. Made extra hard by the fact that obviously you can't drive to this place and everything has to be brought out by boat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, projects like that are, are even more difficult logistically. So over the years, great work, great place to see. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking that if people have never been to Monhegan Island, if they uh, can only do one lighthouse on Main Open Lighthouse Day, I'd certainly uh, recommend that. Uh, and uh, spend some time, maybe even, you know, walking the trails in the woods are beautiful on Monhegan, walking out to the bluffs and so forth. It's just a, a really nice island. Oh, absolutely. And the, uh, what's the shipwreck? DT Sheridan, I believe it is. The uh, the old tug that's on uh, the backside of the, one backside of the island there mm -hmm. um, is something a lot of people love to go see because it's a lot of wreckage that's still there. So, yeah. And it's a tradition that people build little ferry houses in the woods. I think there's, as far as I know, they're still doing that. Doing yeah, I think years. so. So next on our list is Moose Peak Lighthouse. And that's one that certainly is off the beaten track. And uh, I'll just mention that a couple of years ago on Main Open Lighthouse Day, our mutual friend, Michelle Shaw, who uh, is a frequent co-host of this podcast, uh, went to Moose Peak on on, uh, on Main Open Lighthouse Day, and she she had a fantastic experience. She was really excited to to see it, and that's been featured on the podcast as well. Yeah, so Moose Peak Light, located on Mistake Island, which was about what about five miles out of Jonesport, and the private owners have been gracious enough these last couple of years to offer it's limited two boat trips out, and I think this year they were saying about eighty percent of the uh, Capacity has already been filled up, but if you're fortunate enough to be able to get on one of those boats with whatever seats remain, what a place. The island itself is just gorgeous. And then you've got this historic structure with its second order lantern. So that's different than the Fresnel lens. There's no Fresnel lens no, any longer in this, but the second order lantern is really a treat to see. Mm -hmm. um, and they are planning to carry out some really important restoration work from what I understand next year at oh. the site. So um it's something that they're trying to catch up on years of neglect at the site. And I commend them for persevering because again, this, this Island is not an easy one to get to. And, you know, it just makes the life of a preservation is that much harder. So, and they did say the folks who own it did say that the, uh, if you can get yourself out to mistake Island on open lighthouse day, the lighthouse will be open from nine to three to anybody who gets themselves out there. In addition to the uh, limited space they have left on the boats. Right, right. Well, it's awfully nice of them to do all that. And Jeremy and Miriam are, are great people, and they've oh, been on terrific. the podcast as well. Yeah. And Michelle Shaw took part in that interview at my home here, and it was uh, was great meeting them. And uh, it's quite a daunting project, but uh, I, I were you, you and I are rooting for them very much. I know. That. Absolutely. So next is one that you certainly know pretty well. <laughs> I'll said. 
Yeah, Sal's Head Lighthouse. It's uh, headquarters to the American Lighthouse Foundation. And this tower is, uh, we do open it at each week during the summer season, but that doesn't really matter because a lot of folks who come to the area during Man Open Lighthouse Day, they may never have been in a, a lighthouse like Al's Head uh, with its fourth order Fresnel lens. Uh, we can, it's a spacious lantern, uh, three and a half order lantern, which we can add. We usually get about eight people up in that lantern with the guide and it, it, uh, it allows us to move a lot more people through the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. overlooking Penobscot Bay. So the view, if you're up at the Fresnel lens looking out, you're 100 feet above Penobscot Bay. The tower is small, like 26 feet, but that view on top of that 80-foot bluff is just unbelievable. You get you get the Camden Hills, you get the islands of Vinyl Haven and North Haven, Monroe Island. Um, you may very well see sites of Windjammers with their sails mm -hmm. on, the, on the bay. Uh, this will be one of the lights. I should say that, actually, this will be one of the lights that will have some involvement from the Coast Guard. Coast Guard AIDS and Navigation Team Southwest Harbor is going to be staffing Fort Point Light for the day mm -hmm. and helping staff Owls Head Light. And then AIDS and Navigation Team South Portland is going to be staffing Portland Head Light, Spring Point, helping staff Spring Point and staffing Squirrel Point. So the Coast mm -hmm. Guard is definitely going to have a presence during Open Lighthouse Day, which is wonderful. We love it. And the visitors love it. They love connecting the Coast Guard to uh, our Lighthouse Heritage, as they should. So yeah, I, and also Angelie Perot, Jeremy, who you know, um, Lighthouse Dog to the Rescue author for Spot at our site, Spot the Dog, that great story. She will be on hand once again. She loves to come out on Main Open Lighthouse Day. We love having her. And mm -hmm. she's going to be signing her uh, children's book that day. So. Great, great. Yeah, angelie has been on the podcast as well. I was at Al's Head with her for a ceremony back I had to think hard about what year it was, but it was a long time ago, back when uh, Paul Dilger was living there. In the oh, house. when Paul and Mary Ellen, is that when they dedicated the the uh, the, the stone to Spot? For Spot the dog, yeah. yes. That was, what, that was what that was, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Yeah, that's so they great. were, let's see, the Dilgers lived there, I think, from 03 to 06. So it would have been somewhere in that time period. Yeah. Okay. Next on the list is Pemico. Oh, I'll just mention one more thing about Al said. You've got the Interpretive Center and a oh. really nice shop in the house, which your your wife Ann does a fantastic job. Oh, with. yeah. That's I'm glad you reminded me of that. That's true. Yes, we have the Interpretive Center and the, and the gift shop inside. And uh, yeah, just another one of those things where you know it goes back into the project. So it's cool. Absolutely. So Pemico Point is next. Another one of the iconic lighthouses of Maine. Truly iconic, and uh, you know, not just the lighthouse, but the uh, the rocky uh, terrain out in front of the lighthouse, and so many people love to photograph that in the reflection of the lighthouse in the tide pools. Um, this is one of those lighthouses that is open almost every, I guess, every day throughout the summer. But again, on open lighthouse day, it doesn't stop people from going because a lot of people are coming into the area for the first time, and who wouldn't want to go to Pemaquid Point Lighthouse and and see a place like that and just the beauty of the seascape and all. Which sure. also brings a point up that I should actually uh, state. Uh, the lighthouses themselves are open for free on Main Open Lighthouse Day, mm -hmm. but there is going to be associated costs for like parking potentially uh, or transportation out via a ferry or other type right. of boat. So though the towers themselves will be open uh, at free, donations are greatly accepted though for the project. Um, some of the other aspects that connect you to that lighthouse, may there may be a fee for yeah, I know the town of Bristol, I believe, charges uh, not a big fee, but a parking fee to park on the, the grounds there by Pemaquid yeah, Point. I don't lighthouse. remember if they waived that last year or not, but I, I, I don't know for this year. So it's just something that people should be aware of, that they may be asked to pay that entry fee. Uh, sure. And another tower here that um, the American Lighthouse Foundation's chapter, Friends of Pemaquid Point Lighthouse, have done yeoman's work with restoring over the years, both interior and exterior. It looks great. And I think this year... At the uh, towards the fall, they're going to try to target the railing, which is one aspect that hasn't been done yet. So mm -hmm. uh, replace the railing on the lighthouse. But just about everything you see at one time or another has been uh, fully restored there. Yes, uh, it's, it looks fantastic. So next is Portland Breakwater Lighthouse, which a lot of people know better as Bug Light in South Portland. Really unique lighthouse. Oh, this is this may get the title as the most unique looking lighthouse in Maine, and what what an architecture it has. Uh, remind me, Jeremy, what they call this type of architecture. Well, it's it's based on an ancient Greek monument in Athens. Yes, that was that's the inspiration it. for yeah. it. It's uh, the Karagic Monument of Lysicrates. 
There you go. I'm Took glad me a you while said to it. remember that. But yeah. <laughs> glad you said. No, that's really great. And the Rotary there in South Portland has uh, done a terrific job helping raise money, helping staff the tower. Uh, it is owned by uh, South Portland, but the Rotary's had an amazing uh, contribution there over the years, and they will be on hand to staff this lighthouse as well that day. Mm -hmm. I imagine our friend Jack Roberts will be there. He's also been on the podcast. Uh, so next is Portland Headlight, which is, I would say, along with Nubble in York, uh, I would say Portland Head is the iconic lighthouse of Maine. Oh, I'm going to put points up there, too. Those would be the big three. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, but Portland Head, there's just something about it. It, uh, it's quintessential, uh, I think. And to me, it's, uh, it's going to be, it's a difficult one for people in a sense that you do have to arrive very early. They only hand out, I believe it's about 280 tickets. You, so you have to be in line early to be able to make sure you're one of the, you know, we'll say just under 300 people fortunate enough, because it takes all, you know, it takes them six hours to get all those people through that tower, which is why that number is limited. Mm -hmm. um, this is again, one that the Coast Guard will be, will be staffing and uh, overseeing that day. But if you're one of the fortunate ones that have that ticket, it's well worth the wait. I mean, very few people can say they've been inside Portland Headlight uh, over the years in comparison to the amount of people that actually visit the site. Right. So yeah, well worth it. And you're walking, you're walking in so much history, Jeremy. You know that tower was was built smaller, then raised, then brought back down, then raised back up. Yep. So there, there's so many different stories. And that museum there uh, at the lighthouse is so cool inside as well. I I know we were I was part of a podcast with you when we walked through that with Sarah McHugh and we talked to Jeannie Gross at the time, mm -hmm. um, and just saw all the exhibits inside. It's uh, so you get a double treat, and they've got a they got a great gift shop on site too. Yeah. If I remember correctly, it's the third oldest standing lighthouse tower in the country after after Boston Light and, and uh, Sandy after Sandy Hook, Hook and Boston yeah. Light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seventeen ninety one. So next is Rockland Breakwater Light. That takes a little little uh, energy to get out to, but it's worth it. Oh, you know, I, I often say to people, this is this is a lighthouse experience where you go to sea without leaving land because it's it's nearly a mile out into the harbor. If the breakwater wasn't there, you'd probably be hard pressed to call it a harbor be almost like a little bay um that lighthouse actually the breakwater actually creates the uh the sense of the harbor in there but it's spacious water inside that harbor and yeah it's just really cool i mean not there's it's it's probably there's nothing like it in maine in terms of the keeper's house a uh, very unique looking keeper's house with the boathouse attached to it uh and imagine being out at a place like that uh, even big seas coming in there. Uh, I remember the Patriots Day Gale of 2007 had seas going completely over top of the boathouse, and it did do some damage to the boathouse. Yeah, uh, had to be reinforced on the on the northeast end. But uh, yeah, it, it it might look like it's not exposed, but in some ways it's very exposed, and also a place where the tides of the moon tides will will go over the breakwater and, and really cut off access. We're fortunate this year uh, because the high tide is actually occurring at 8.45 in the morning. It's not even a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the city of Rockland, which now, uh, city of Rockland has always owned the lighthouse, but the city of Rockland now uh, is overseeing the lighthouse and its restoration. Uh, and they were thrilled because they could participate this year because the, the, it'll really go through the whole low tide cycle. So nobody yeah. will have any issues walking out. Uh, so 10 to 4 for Rockland Breakwater Lighthouse, both the house and the tower will be open to climb. Great. Spring Point Ledge Light in uh, South Portland is next. Uh, the, one of the very few uh, what people often call a spark plug type light in Maine. Oh, this is, this is actually super unique. If you think about caissons, they're usually established in the water over a ledge. Uh, in Maine, we had Crabtree Ledge, which is no longer with us. That fell over in the 50s. But you still have Goose Rocks and Lubeck Channel uh, lights, which are caissons. And Spring Point started out that way. Uh, as you know, Jeremy, it was freestanding in the water. And in the 1950s, they connected the breakwater to the lighthouse, which has been really a godsend for uh, today's preservation efforts to be. It's not easy to go out that breakwater for, for projects and stuff like that, but at least it's connected to land now. And the Spring Point Ledge Light Trust uh, over the years has just, again, like so many groups, done an amazing job. You walk inside and it's totally outfitted on all the floors. As you know, Jeremy, we, we did a podcast with Arthur Green yep. inside there and got a tour of that. And to see the um, the furniture and the and the 
commitment to trying to demonstrate life as it might have been there uh, in its heyday is just a really cool experience for visitors. So yeah, you get the view, but then you get the experience inside a place like that. And kind of like we've heard stories of keepers just having to walk in circles in a case on light like that. Imagine being stationed at one of those lights. People get to yeah. experience that. Yeah. And there's a little exhibit about uh, Gus Wilson, the famous keeper who carved duck decoys and his duck decoys are among the most uh, prized in the countries now. Springpoint also has a, um, a gift area uh, on land before you get yep. to the breakwater. So they have that as well. Again, that helps the project. Yep. Next is Squirrel Point on the Kennebec River again. And that one is not normally open. So that's a, a cool opportunity. Oh, definitely. This is a, and this is an adventure. Just, uh, it's like a, what is it? About a quarter mile walk to the lighthouse. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's, it's a little strenuous, a little bit up and down hill. It uh, is, it is, but that's part of the adventure for Squirrel Point that I just love. I love taking those hikes back there in the summer or the winter, uh, winter it's really peaceful. Um, but this is a lighthouse that the Coast Guard will staff and open. Like you said, Jeremy, it's uh, it's generally not open, but on this day. And they'll be open 10 to 3. And uh, it's uh, it's well worth the walk out there. Also, the Keeper's House, which uh, the citizens for Squirrel Point are working on its restoration, will be open. And the Boathouse, which I know um, the citizens for Squirrel Point Lighthouse have um, restored the exterior of the Boathouse and rebuilt the wooden ways that go mm -hmm. up you know, down to the water there. Uh, so work continues to be done at that site. It's very, it's another challenge, although it's on land where it's located. It's very cumbersome to to have to even walk there, let yeah. alone carry out restoration projects. But they're, they are not missing a beat. They keep at it. And it's really great to see this place um, continue to be returned to its former glory. It is. It is. It's a, it's another really, really pretty spot for sure. So next is uh, West Quaddy Head. It's actually the last on our list at the easternmost. People, I think, are often surprised that something called West Quaddy Head is actually the easternmost point in the continental U United States. Yeah. And, and this year, the tower will be closed for climbing. There's some uh, elements inside the tower that they... Uh that the state of Maine, the Bureau of Parks and Lands would like to uh, repair before they open the tower back up. This is generally open, uh, but I'll tell you what, if you're up in the down east area, this is so well worth it that it's a distinctive lighthouse. It's one of everybody's favorites who come to Maine because of its red and white, you know, candy cane type stripes. Um, but the museum inside, which is really cool, upgraded with a lot of different exhibits this past year or two, uh, is is worth the visit if you're up in the area and just taking in uh, the beauty that is in that that you know Bold Coast area, and yeah. uh, it's just it's well worth it. So again, for those who are up in that area and you, you don't you know you you don't know what you're not going to drive the whole ways, please stop by West Quaddy Head Lighthouse and uh, and say hello to the folks inside and uh, like I said, enjoy the day there. I completely agree. And earlier I said that. Portland Head, Nubble, and Pemblecote Point Point would probably be the most iconic lighthouses in Maine, but let's add, definitely ask what Ed West Quaddy to that. Uh, absolutely. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Totally distinctive. And we would be remiss if we didn't, uh, of course, the, they're participating, uh, the museums of uh, the Maine Lighthouse Museum in Rockland yep. and the Maine Maritime Museum in Bath are, uh, every year they participate. And uh, Jeremy, you know, Maine Lighthouse Museum founded by... Uh, Anybody who knew Ken Black called him a friend, you know, and his wife, uh, Dot Black, today continues to oversee the operations at the Maine Lighthouse Museum, has the uh, largest collection of Fresnel lenses in one spot, I believe, in the country, and yep. a lot of host of uh, other, like Coast Guard, life-saving uh, exhibits. Uh, so while you're visiting lighthouses uh, in between, stop by the Maine Lighthouse Museum uh, in Rockland and the Maine Maritime Museum. Well, talk about that exhibit, Jeremy. You you, yeah. you know that. Uh, yeah. You want to say Se something about that? Well, it's the second order lens from Cape Elizabeth, from the two lights at Cape Elizabeth, from the east light uh, that was removed from there. I actually, first time I visited the, uh, the east light at Cape Elizabeth, that lens was still in there. Uh, I'm trying to think of when it was removed. Was it early 90s? Something like Is that. Is it like 94? If I my memory. The, somewhere like around that. there. Yeah. Maybe early to mid 90s. And uh, it's a beautiful display they created there. The lens was on display for many years at Cape Elizabeth Town Hall, but they built this sort of uh, mock lantern room uh, to enclose to house the, the lens there. 
and they have this video screen behind it, this uh, kind of panoramic video going, I believe it's like a time lapse, right, of the, the area there? Actually it is. It is. The, the museum off. actually, before that was established, they actually um, placed cameras inside the lantern at Cape Elizabeth East mm -hmm. Light for all four seasons. And that's how they got the footage of, they, it's really fast moving and it takes you through like all four seasons over a period of a few minutes, which yep. is like, it's like you walk, you feel like, you almost feel like you're, the idea is that you feel like you're in the lantern or outside the lantern actually seeing all this. And it's uh, super well done. And uh, yeah, and then not only do you have this exhibit at the Maine Maritime Museum, but the, uh, the unprecedented exhibits for um, shipbuilding and other maritime, mm -hmm. you know, exhibits there at the museum are first class and well worth the visit. Definitely. A lot of great maritime art there as well. And a really nice gift shop. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are into, you could just do a tour of gift shops uh, easily uh, on Maine Open Lighthouse Day if that's what, what people are into. So I think we've completed the list. And uh, I hope we've given people uh, maybe a little more information and reasons to to visit these lighthouses if they haven't before. And as we close, Jeremy's right. I mean, we, we've we've gone through this list and, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun in the making. But do consider if you... Um, have the time to be able to possibly volunteer at one of these lighthouses or become a member or, um, you know, just take in the experience of, of historic charm that's being preserved and understand that that's not as easy as it looks. And we have to tip our cap to all these groups and all the volunteers to the U.S. Coast Guard, who's still maintaining the lights and at some of these places, the foghorns that still remain. Uh, there's a lot of people putting their hands on these structures and we need more. So if you have the inclination to help volunteer at one of the sites, I know, talk to any of these groups, they'd, they'd love to talk to you. I'd love to add you to their team. For sure. I'm glad you brought that up because that's a, a constant need for sure. But volunteers at these places do do so much work. And of course, the Coast Guard. So uh, before we wrap things up for today, there's another uh, topic I'd like to touch on. I'm uh, almost mentioned it when we were talking about Marshall Point Lighthouse a few minutes ago, but tell me what happened at Marshall Point recently, something uh, a little out of the ordinary, and uh, you were somewhat personally involved there recently. Well, yeah, it was a little out of the ordinary. A lightning strike at Marshall mm -hmm. Point Lighthouse on July 27th. And that's, you know, lighthouses get struck by lightning periodically, and usually their lightning protection is uh is adequate to uh take that energy away from damaging anything inside but sometimes it doesn't and in this case it uh, the lightning strike really fried the 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 led the lb44 beacon and the mras which is a mariner radio activated sound signal system for the foghorn mm -hmm. and put both the light and horn out of commission and uh diane heath who uh resides in the apartment above the uh the, the keeper's house there. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, she said that on the July 27th, I think it was around 6 p.m., she just heard this awful crash, lightning just hitting. And I can only imagine the sound of that. And you think about in the past, um, you know, lightning hitting. Uh, but in the past, it might have damaged the mantle inside of, a, of an oil lamp, which the keeper would, would re replace. But in today's modern electronics, it's a whole lot more than that. So the Coast Guard AIDS and Navigation Team Southwest Harbor visited the site a few days later on July 31st and just took assessment of everything that was going on with that. And it really, here's a case where you have to give the Coast Guard credit because, you know, I think a lot of people thought this repair was going to potentially be weeks, if not months, to uh, carry out. And the uh, unit was able to contact, you know, supplies in their, in their mid-Atlantic region find an LED replacement for that, have it shipped. And within a period of 12 days from the visit, the light and the horn are back on. So, uh, and not only that, but when the MRAS was fried, this unit that uh, activates the fog signal, you no longer really can get those. So we have a replacement part called a WinTech, which is does the same thing. But you have, we had to do some troubleshooting on how to rewire that. So that was all done at the uh, lighthouse shop at Southwest Harbor. Mm -hmm. All that troubleshooting was done. Uh, give the electrician mates there a lot of credit for uh, being prepared. So that when we went back to install all the equipment, it literally was just like, you know, it was like clockwork. 
because we we knew what we had to do and, and fix it. Uh, interesting for that though, uh, the National Lighthouse Day, Marshall Point was open. So anybody who visited Marshall Point Lighthouse and climbed that lighthouse on that day, because it was open to climb that day, there was no beacon inside. So here's this lighthouse with no light inside. So it was an interesting experience for people on, uh, on National Lighthouse Day who climbed it. But it just goes to show you that our lighthouses today, still the weather can play a factor. Uh, it's, it's not as uncommon as you think lightning strikes, but it's, it's kind of rare that they kind of fry the equipment like they did in this case. Yeah. But the lighthouse is up and running again, and everybody's thrilled about that in the local area. So, yeah, I bet that's uh, pretty impressive to have everything back up and, and running in, in 12 days. With, uh, the, the Coast Guard does, uh, yeah, they do a lot of good work. And sometimes in this case, they did yeoman's work to get that back up and running so quickly. You know, you think, oh, you just have all these parts on the shelf, but that's not how it works in the modern day a lot of times it's so different than you know retail stores and others where a lot of real-time delivery so it's like when you have a unit like that go um yeah you gotta you gotta scramble and say okay where do we have one of these and they they sprung into action and every everybody involved did a great job yeah here at uh portsmouth harbor lighthouse near me of course we have a, a chapter of the america lighthouse foundation friends of portsmouth harbor lighthouses and uh, I know you've seen it. We know that at some point in its history, there was a lightning strike because one of the finials on the Lantern Room Gallery is melted, basically. Um, That's a, uh, when you No other possible me, explanation for that that I know of. Yeah, when you showed me that, I was just like, I just marveled at that. I'm like, the energy, the, the, the heat, everything is just like, wow. And at Marshall Point, inside the museum, they have a ventilator ball in there. Um, that shows the lightning strike cracked the ventilator yep. ball right in half. Like it just, it's one piece, but it's got this gap in it. And uh, it's like, that's the power of the lightning, you know? So yeah, light, uh, lighthouses, as, as it's easy to imagine, are, you know, the taller points on these exposed locations. So for lightning, that's, you know, I guess it's a favorite spot to strike, but yeah, sometimes it goes bad, but this was a case that it, it, it fried the, the uh, aid to navigation and, we got it back up and run real quick. So yeah, that's fantastic. So uh, before we uh, sign off here, uh, I know the weather's been kind of up and down this year, uh, both for me and on the New Hampshire sea coast and along the main coast. But I think it's still been a pretty busy year for you at Owlset, has it? Very busy, Jeremy. I, I we were not expecting it to be quite as busy as it was. I mean, we and what I say that is is like we knew um, post COVID, so twenty twenty one. It was just crazy busy. We knew international travel wasn't uh, as easy back then, but so 2022, there was just a slight, it was still really busy, but not, so 2023, we didn't, here it's busier than it was in 2021. Mm -hmm. it, it is panning out to be the busiest summer that we've ever had in the 12 years at Owl's Headlight. So despite the weather, and it's been kind of dreadful, a lot of fog, a lot of rain day after day, especially from june through mid-july uh, a lot of people around here are just saying we're just now experiencing summer and uh, here we're looking down the barrel of labor day and it's like wow where did it go but yeah no great year and i hope that's true with um, a lot of the other lighthouses because you know everybody's trying to do their best to uh, continue to support their projects so yeah we're happy to see it busy so, Bob, uh, I think uh, it's hard to believe we've been talking for, for an hour-ish already. Uh, time flies when we talk lighthouses. It's always a pleasure talking with you, of course. And uh, I hate to break it off. We could keep talking. But uh, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. And good luck with Main Open Lighthouse Day. I know uh, you're always busy with it. There's a lot of work for you to do as well. But, you know, like all good things, we're going to do this again. So uh, it, it's uh, it's always great to talk with you. You do a fantastic job with the podcast and uh, appreciate your work because there's a lot of planning that goes into all this and a lot of work on your end. So thank you for what you do to bring these types of events and history to people all over well, the world. You're, you're welcome. And thank you for saying that. And it's always easy with... You know, with somebody like you, who I know so well, and we can just just chat. It's one of the the uh, rare times when I don't have to prepare questions or anything like that. Because <laughs> we're, we're lighthouse brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that's a good note to close on. So, Bob, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I'm sure we'll be talking soon, and we'll be talking on the podcast again soon too. I'm sure. So, thank you, awesome. Bob. Awesome, Jeremy. Thank you.
To learn more about Maine Open Lighthouse Day, go to lighthousefoundation.org. Uh, the link to the information is right on the front page. Uh, also, of course, check out uslhs.org to learn all about everything the U.S. Lighthouse Society has to offer, including tours, preservation grants, and so much more. We'll be back with a new episode next week. Until then, to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thank you so much for listening, and keep a good light. I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.